Steve, I want to ask you, I, I remember the first time I saw, you know, Fight Free Right to Party on MTV, and, and I know you had, you know, there was a lot of hair metal on at the time, and it really dominating the, the channel. How did you get involved with Def Jam so early, and, and what did you do with that? <coughs> I met Russell Simmons in his lawyer's office in 19, late 1983, early 1984, and... Uh, he was looking for a deal for his brother's group, Run DMC, and they were talking to a little indie label in New York called Profile, and before they made that decision, they were looking for any other interested parties. I was, um, Gary had gone on to Geffen, I had gone on to Columbia Records uh, in uh, 1984 into 1985, and uh, it was something very charming about Russell. He was very shy, he was very soft-spoken, he was almost socially awkward in, in that first meeting. It's hard to think of him that way these days, although he remains a certain genuine spirit uh, about him, and you guys all know who he is. Um, I, I, when I went on to Columbia, I reconnected with Russell unsuccessfully um, on, the, on the Run DMC term, but in that intervening year they had made quite a statement for themselves, and in that intervening year Russell had met up with a NYU student named by the name of Rick Rubin and they had put out, they'd started a little label called Def Jam and they put out a half a dozen 12 inch singles under that label name. Basically the label was run out of Rick's NYU dorm room in, off of Washington Square Park in uh, Greenwich Village. And uh, they were making a movie called Crush Groove which was a thinly veiled um, kind of bio of these two guys that were starting this little hip hop label. and were managing some bands, and it was basically the, the Rick Rubin, Russell Simmons, run, DM, run DMC story, so it was a, an ironic case of life imitating art, imitating life, imitating art, because I, I would go meet these guys and listen to cassettes that were poorly marked, that were in a shoebox on the production set at Danceteria, where they were filming a lot of, a lot of the Crush Groove film, and uh, the Beastie Boys was one of those early 12-inch singles that they had released, and I went to see an early show of theirs, and LL Cool J would basically come to Rick's dorm room and rap with his boom box, and there was something, like, as Gary is talking about, the cultural underbelly or something that you felt was about to explode. To me, it was punk rock and new clothes, and that was sort of my coming-of-age era in the late 70s, and promoted a lot of those bands when I was at school and played a lot of their records and went to CBGBs and saw a lot of their early performances. So to me, this was kind of punk rock round too, and it had the same um, kind, of, kind of cultural freedom to it, it had the same kind of explosiveness to it, and there was something savant-like about Rick's being kind of a, just a pure fan of music and, a, and a, just a real record guy. He was as much into beat as he was into riff, he was as much into ACDC as he was into Africa Bombata, and those were things that really appealed to me, because my crew would go to places like Club Negril or the Roxy, where it was it was a blend of the kind of downtown hipster mud post mud club guys and the the kids that would come from uptown that were into the Sugar Hill Gang records and that kind of style fusion genre bending smash up stuff really appealed and Columbia Records at the time were looking for a way to get into some of the younger end in in the urban music world and had no hip hop whatsoever some of the other major labels had stuck their toe in the water and I somehow was able to persuade the higher ups to give Rick and Russell a, a, a closely managed label deal which my primary responsibility was identifying uh, a, a small focus number of groups within their wide universe to put out through this relationship Def Jam and Columbia and became the first example of an independent hip hop label and a major label the size of Columbia coming uh, coming together and the first records we put out were LL Cool J's radio and uh, the Beastie Boys 12-inch single She's On It and shortly thereafter Licensed to Ill which became the first number one hip-hop record and went on to sell about 10 or 12 million copies so it was it was it was just the music fan in me going let's take a shot with this there's something culturally going on analogous to what Gary's talking about with I think that's happening. that's a big lesson for all you guys is Whatever, uh, you know, uh, the biggest problem that we three have with the record business <coughs> is putting things in a box and 
you know, finding the next so-and-so that's just like the three other ones so that we can get it into the radio system and get it on the air. These guys have always shown um, uh, a very leading edge kind of nose and ear about them where, you know, they're, they're spotting the next thing and they're, they're, they're really looking for the next thing that, that's not like uh, the copycat A&R system that is, you know, kind of beleaguering the industry. Which kind of brings me around to your stint at A&M Records uh, and your stint at Capitol Records because both of those are kind of hallmark times for me in the music business. Uh, you know, A&M got to be known as the artist development label. There was no better label for artist development, which these days is very, very tough to get. And I respect both of these guys because they do allow artist development to happen. They understand that it's not always, not always about the first record being a big smash record. It might be about the fourth or the fifth record. Steve, you and I were standing in um, um, whatever that arena in London is, uh, Wembley, uh, back in December watching a very sold-out Kings of Leon show. And I'm like looking around and the place is going nuts. And I look at you and I go, man, I just can't believe this has happened. And, and you looked at me and goes, don't forget, son, this took five years. This took five years. You know, we've seen this band play for 100 people here. We've seen them play for 1,000. And now we're seeing them play for 11,000. But it took repeated tries and repeated development time. And, and I think both of you uh, understand that.